We all have an opportunity to shape our food system by the choices we make and what we eat. It's important that we diversify the genetic base of agriculture. This is important for food security, for the sustainability, and for improving the quality of our food system. And we can diversify the base of agriculture by diversifying what we choose to eat. Severe crop uniformity at a genetic level makes agriculture very vulnerable. You might remember learning about the Irish potato famine. Yes, it was complicated by politics and social issues, but the fact remains that in the mid-1840s in Ireland, most farmers were planting only one crop, potatoes, and only one type of potatoes. So when a new disease showed up, there was complete crop failure across the entire country, and this lasted for years, resulting in a million people dying because there wasn't anything to eat. A similar wide-scale crop failure happened here in the United States in 1970. There was a blight that took out most of the corn crop. Fortunately, it only lasted for one season, and at that time, we had other food sources to rely on. So there wasn't mass famine, but the loss of this crop had ripple effects across the entire world. Now today, we still have some crop uniformity issues. Industry is most seriously concerned about the uniformity producing vulnerability in bananas, citrus, chocolate, and coffee. So crop uniformity isn't always bad. It's actually been very good for most of agriculture. It allows for mechanization in the field for production and for post-harvest processing, which has allowed ag businesses to scale up and produce more food on less land. A lot of uniformity in crops is attributed to improved seed varieties. These new varieties displace old historic varieties. They're improved, they're higher yielding, they're easier to grow, they're more disease resistant, so they're better for the growers right now. So the latest UN report on global malnourishment looks pretty good. We currently have less malnourished people in the world today than we did 25 years ago, despite population growth. And we currently produce more than enough food to feed everyone, we just still have an access and distribution problem. However, though we're doing all right with agriculture, 80% of the global caloric intake comes from less than a dozen crops. And of these dozen crops, we're only using a fraction of the genetic diversity available there. This puts us in an extremely vulnerable situation in the event of climate change bringing previously unknown stress to our agriculture system. So we, as consumers, can change this by diversifying what we eat. And the first step in diversifying what we eat is to learn about something new. Today I'm going to tell you about lima beans. I happen to study lima beans for my PhD, so I'm a little bit biased. But you could tell a similar story about any of your favorite crops. So lima beans, we actually should be calling them lima beans, because they were originally exported from Lima, Peru in crates. And when the crates arrived, marked lima, it was mispronounced. You might know them better as butter beans, which is a great name because it reflects their creamy texture and rich flavor. And their Latin name is Phaseolus lunatus. These are the lima beans most of us are familiar with. This is what you can get in your local grocery store. The green succulent type are grown in the mid-Atlantic area around here. They're harvested immature and usually canned or frozen, but you can also eat them fresh. The white varieties are mostly grown in the Western United States where there's a longer growing season so they can dry down, grow to maturity in the field. And then after being harvested, a lot of them are actually shipped to Asia to be turned into sweet bean paste. But you can get them in the local dry food section of your grocery store. So California has a long history of growing lima beans. Before there were Beverly Hills mansions, there were Beverly Hills lima bean fields. And still today, California growers enjoy growing lima beans in rotation because they require little water they're nitrogen fixing, and they produce a lot of biomass, all of which are good for the soil. So at the request of California growers, and as part of the University of California Davis bean team, I was tasked with helping to develop improved lima bean varieties with insect resistance so that California growers could use less pesticides. So in order to create a better bean for the future, we need to understand about the past. Going back three million years ago, 
lima beans became a species. They separated from other beans someplace in the Americas, and they spread out through the Isthmus of Panama, down through South America. They crossed the Andes and continued along the coast of the Pacific. They also went all the way up into Mexico. So over three million years of natural selection, lima beans evolved to grow from sea level to over 5,000 feet of elevation. And they evolved to grow in hot, dry regions and in cold, wet regions. And they accumulated a lot of mutations over three million years. So the DNA in lima beans that are adapted to grow on mountaintops is different than the DNA of lima beans that are adapted to grow on riverbanks. Then, just 10,000 years ago, approximately, agriculture started and lima beans were domesticated. What this means was early farmers collected beans from the wild and planted them in their garden. A few of the beans grew and some of the beans they liked, they replanted those beans. So those chosen beans got to pass their DNA onto the next generation. So similar to natural selection, human selection also affects the DNA that gets passed on to the next generation. We know that lima beans were domesticated on at least two occasions, once in Mesoamerica, southern Mexico, and then once in the western Andes. And we know this based on archaeological information found at these sites, as well as on genetic data. Today's cultivated lima beans, are mo their DNA is most similar to wild lima beans from these areas, which means wild lima beans from the rest of Central America and South America didn't get a chance to contribute their DNA to the beans we're growing today. Then, just about 500 years ago, there was an explosion of seed and food trade around the world. This happened after Columbus made contact with the New World and regular trade routes were established. Prior to Columbus's trip, there were no lima beans, potatoes, or tomatoes in Europe. And we know this from looking at old cookbooks. So we're kind of up to speed on how much diversity could exist in lima beans in the wild and cultivated now that we know they're grown all around the world. So these two are lima beans. This is a small example of what could exist. This is just what I brought home in my pocket after work. And you can see there's a lot of diversity in there. So how does one access this diversity? As a public bean breeder, it's easy to contact a seed bank. A seed bank is very simply a giant freezer that holds a collection of seeds that have been collected from around the world to preserve them for future use. So lima beans have been collected or all around the world. This is an example in Latin America. You can see the yellow spots going along both coasts of South America. So we have lima beans in seed banks from all of these places. There's also a lot of South America where lima beans have not been collected. It might be because they're not growing there. It's more likely because no one's gone to collect. So if you're an adventurer and you're interested in botany, actually collecting seeds and contributing them to seed banks is something you can do that adds value to agriculture. And if you choose to, this is what a feral lima bean would look like growing on the edge of a farmer's field in Mexico. You can tell it's a lima bean because of the dry moon-shaped pods. So I did not get to go seed collecting. Um, instead, I contacted the seed banks. Um, the USDA maintains several seed banks. Their lima bean collection is held in Pullman, Washington, and has over 500 varieties of lima beans. Pretty impressive. But the world's largest collection is held in Cali, Colombia at the International Center of Tropical Agriculture. I got to visit. They have over 3,000 varieties of lima beans, which is pretty exciting for a lima bean enthusiast. <laughs> and they do give tours. So our research team ordered 300 exotic varieties of lima beans in hopes that some of them would add insect resistance to the California varieties. We planted out these 300 different types of lima beans. And they all grew in California, but only 10% of them flowered, and only 1% of them produced enough seeds to consider adding it to the lima bean breeding program for California. That's a 99% failure rate, planting this diverse population of lima beans. That's not something a farmer can do, but that is something that a public breeder can do in order to try to add this diversity to the lima beans. So I took these three, bean, these three new bean varieties that actually produce seeds in California and crossed them to leading California varieties in hopes that the progeny would inherit insect resistance. Well, the progeny look good. They're high yielding, they're insect resistant, but they're speckled. And there's no market for speckled lima beans in California. California grows white lima beans. So I'll take these beans and I'll cross them back to the white parent 
and hope that they maintain the insect resistance, exotic DNA, and lose the speckles. But while I'm doing that, if a California farmer offers to sell you speckled beans with less pesticide, consider taking her up on the offer. So our lab is also simultaneously crossing popular California varieties with each other in hopes that recombining the DNA, this new mixture, will be more insect resistant. The progeny also look good, and they're all white, but this doesn't actually add any new DNA. It just remixes the DNA that's already there. So if there's vulnerability present in the California lima beans, it's still there. So, like my father, relaxing in this original beanbag chair, we here are in a position of privilege. We get to choose what we eat. So we should be conscientious consumers and choose to eat diversity so that farmers can plant diversity and we can diversify our agriculture system. There have been more than a thousand crops domesticated, so lima beans are, isn't the only thing we have to choose from. There's a lot to choose from. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh.